We're in Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 12. And I'm just going to read the first section because it has to do with this. But it says, in those days, he went out to the mountain. Talking about Jesus. He went out to the mountain to pray. And he prayed all night long. He prayed all night and he continued to pray to God. And when when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Then he goes on and he names them Simon, who he called, uh, named Peter and Andrew and his brother James and John and Philip and Bartholomew, Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon, who is called the Zealot and Judas, the son of James and Judas, who be, or Judas Iscariot, who became the traitor. Now, the one thing I want to make, just kind of draw out of that real quick uh, in relation to these, you know, Jesus had his followers, Jesus had his disciples, and basically these are the people who followed him from the time of his baptism or around there. And out of those, then he called 12 more people to be the apostles. But what blows my mind is this is Jesus. This is God, man. Okay. This is hundred uh, percent man, hundred percent God. He came down. And a lot of times we think, you know, that Jesus had it. I mean, he did have it all figured out because he was God, but you know, we figured like, you know, he has a special connection to God, but he still prayed. Like before Jesus called his 12 apostles, before he took his disciples, all of, you know, his big group of disciples and then called his 12 apostles, he spent all night and he prayed uh, before he did that. And I was just kind of sh- struck by that. Like Jesus himself took a long time to pray for who he was going to be ministering to. And, you know, us as a church, as we are coming into this Easter season, we're going to be doing some different invite things and we're going to be, um, you know, we want to be praying for opportunities to share the gospel, to invite different people. But we want to kind of model this a little bit. And we want to spend time praying specifically for people. So what I'm going to challenge you to do in the next couple of weeks is I want you to take this card, put it in your Bible or put it on your, um, your, your uh, mirror or whatever you're going to see every day. And I want you to take a couple of days and I want you just to pray, God, lay people on my heart. God, who do you want me to be praying for specifically, you know, neighbors or coworkers or family? Um, and I want you to just pray. And then as God brings those people to heart, write those down, write those names down on there, right? Three names or families or whatever down on there. And then I want you to pray and take those families and spend sp- some specific time praying for those three families. Get, you know, just text them and let them know, hey, I want to be praying for you. Or, you know, hey, you know, God just put you on my heart. I want to, and just get prayer requests and just spend time praying and praying and praying and praying. And then after you've prayed for these people for about a week, just be like, Lord, who do you want me to invite to church? Who do you want me to share the gospel with? Who do you want me to reach out and start trying to bring in because they desperately need Jesus? And I want you to write that one name down, that one family down, and then I want you to specifically start praying for that family and start inviting them. Because our goal, we, we want people to come in on Easter and even before, they come before you, so that's great. But a lot of times people don't accept the first invitation. A lot of times people don't, you know, it takes four or five times. And so we want to start now but just being really intentional, being very missional, praying for people, um, asking the Holy Spirit to move in us, to show us who he wants, and then we want to start going after. So uh, that's kind of like a pre-sermon before the sermon. That's not really my sermon, okay? So you got those notes down? You good? You good? Okay. Uh, but take these home and use it. It's just a way for us to be able to start to pray for people. But this morning we are, we're going to be in Luke chapter 6, and you can start going there. And we're going to be talking about the cost of discipleship, the cost of discipleship. But uh, kind of open up, um, when I was in high school, there was this band I really liked. Uh, Matt and I were actually talking about earlier today. Some of you might know who they were. They were kind of this like underground, somewhat underground. I don't know. I don't know what you'd call them. But it's a band called Five Iron Frenzy. It was like this ska punk rock band. You got me. Even Brian, was, Brian was rocking with us at the time. It was, like, it was one of my favorite bands of all time when I was in high school. And my, when I was going into my, when I graduated, going into that summer, they went on their farewell tour. It was like, I was heartbroken. And so they went on this farewell tour. My brother and another good friend of mine, we bought tickets for the show that was closest to us. And we went to that show. And then we started talking. We're like, you know what? We could go to their final show. 
And so we looked it up. We found out that it was November 22nd uh, in 2003 out in Denver, Colorado. And so we pulled up, you know, we went to Ticketmaster or whatever. I don't remember what it was. But we went and we pulled up the tickets. We're like, These tickets aren't that bad. They're actually pretty cheap. And I was like, yeah, look, we could do that. It's, you know, it's a Friday night. We could drive all night and then go to the show and sleep in the car. I don't, I don't remember what we said. But we're like, yeah. So we bought it thinking like this is going to be the cheapest, best trip of all time. And it was, at the time, I felt one of the, like, the best purchases I'd ever made in my life. And so I was all pumped about this show. And then about uh, a month before we were going to drive out to the show, my uh, clutch went out in my car. And I was like, it's not a big deal. That's the car we're going to take. I'll get it fixed. You know, it'll, it's fine. We can still do this. And so I took it in this shop. And then, you know, he came back with the estimate of how much it was. Whew. Clutches are not cheap. And then I started, um, you know, kind of pricing out what it would be to drive out there for all the gas and the hotels and the food. Started putting that in, you know, relationship to the clutch that I had to get repaired. And I started realizing I don't have that kind of money. When I started tallying up the cost, I started to realize, man, I can't make this trip happen. And I remember having to call up my brother and our good friend and say, guys, I can't do this. I got to bail. And I did. It was one of the saddest moments of my life. This was going to be the greatest trip of my life. And I had to bail on it because of money. Because I hadn't counted the cost. You know, and a lot of times when we start to talk about being a disciple of Jesus and a follower of Jesus, um, a lot of people get really excited about the person of Jesus and the power of Jesus and the things that Jesus could offer. But when he starts to realize, when he starts to see what it actually costs, that number of disciples starts to get less and less and less. You know, this is too often how we follow Jesus. And when we first see, we're excited, but then we start to fall away. But if we're going to be followers of Jesus, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, if we're going to stay the course We need to be disciples that find find blessing in suffering. We need to be disciples that find blessing in suffering. And that's what Jesus brings out when he's teaching here in Luke chapter 6. And so I already read verse 12 down all the way through verse 16. That's part of it, but I'm going to jump into verse 17 and pick it up there. It says, And then he came down with them, and he stood on a level place, with a great crowd of disciples and a great multitude of people from all of Judea and Jerusalem and of the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cleared. And all the crowd sought to touch him for the power came out of him and and healed them all. All. So the first thing that we see in this passage is that a lot of people are drawn to Jesus. A lot of people are drawn to Jesus. Luke brings out this idea and he kind of starts this section talking about when Jesus was going up. And we talked about it a little, just a little bit ago, but he went up on the mountainside and he was praying. And then as he was praying, he called his disciples to him. That's kind of the first circle of people around Jesus. And these are the people who had been following Jesus. These are the people who've been with Jesus through a lot of his miracles. And then out of that, he then called his 12, his apostles, his, you know, his inner ring. And Jesus was very intentional about how he called these disciples. And really, this is what we want to be. We want to be disciples of Christ. You know, we get to the end of Christ's life. This is the very mission that God has called us all to be on. He tells us to go make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them uh, to obey all the things that I have commanded. And you know, so this is our call. We're called to make disciples. But what does that look like? How do we move people through that? Because a lot of people are drawn to Jesus. And even, you know, kind of going down, then he, Jesus comes down and he gets off of the mountain. Now, this is probably uh, a different sermon than the Sermon on the Mount. And so it correlates to uh, the Matthew Sermon on the Mount because, you know, a lot of times Jesus would probably go around and he would preach the same message in different places to different people. And so it was, it was a lot of the same things, but it was, it was probably a, a little bit different 
uh, circumstance. And so it was probably the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain, because it's the flat area that he's talking about, the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain. But he is dealing with a lot of the same stuff. But he comes down and he engages with the crowd, and it says that there's a great crowd of his disciples. And so there's a whole crowd of his disciples that are around. They came up on the mountain, and then there was a whole multitude of people that were drawn to him. And he kind of lays out there from Judea, which was the kind of the greater area of Galilee that they were in. So Galilee was in Judea, and Judea was all, all around there. And Jerusalem, which is kind of the other side. And then there was Tyre and Sidon, which is the, the seacoast and the outskirts. And basically what he was trying to show, Luke is trying to show, is there were a lot of people coming. And they were wanting to see Jesus from all different walks of life and backgrounds. And they wanted to see Jesus for a lot of different reasons. It says they wanted to see Jesus to hear him. They wanted to hear him teach. We've seen earlier in the book that, that they were drawn to him because he was preaching and teaching with authority. They wanted to hear him teach. They wanted to be healed of their diseases, which Jesus did gladly. He was putting his power on display. They wanted to be cured of their unclean spirits. And here... Um, you know, the, uh, Luke makes a very clear distinction between diseases and unclean spirits, and Jesus was doing both. He was healing the physically sick, and he was taking care of and casting out the demons of demon-possessed people. And you know, this is so much so that they wanted just to touch Jesus because his power was going out of them, and when they would touch him, they would be healed. And you can see this. All of these people were coming around Jesus. They wanted to hear him teach. They wanted to be healed. They wanted to experience his power. And, you know, Jesus really does. He draws in a lot of people. And a lot of us are intrigued with a lot of good things of Jesus. And we know that Luke in this section, you know, basically from chapter 4 all the way to chapter 9, he is slowly revealing himself. He's slowly showing himself to be the Messiah. And he's doing that by his teaching. He's doing that by, you know, showing off his power to show that he really is God. But one of the things that we need to understand and that we need to remember is just because we're intrigued by Jesus doesn't make us a disciple of Jesus. Just because we like the power that Jesus has, that we're interested in the power or the blessing or the authority that Jesus, just because... We know these things. We're intrigued by these things. Or other people are, know these things, are intrigued by these things. It doesn't mean that they're a disciple of Jesus. And a lot of times we get those things kind of mixed up. We think that anybody who's interested, that's good enough. But it's not. You know, we're called, we are called to be disciples of Jesus and we are called to make disciples of Jesus. And just because people are intrigued doesn't mean they're actually at the point where they believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, and Jesus does, he wants to love and care and put his power on display. And he wants to show himself off to people, but that's not the only thing. And we need to understand that you know, that, that Jesus or that, follow, that people who are intrigued by Jesus or drawn to Jesus aren't just, aren't disciples yet. You know, when you look at um, a lot of church stats today, there's a guy by the name of uh, Ed Stetzer. He's a, uh, a missiologist, as he likes to call himself, and he does a lot of research. And there's other guys, Thomas Rainer's another one out there. And, you know, you go out there, you can look at a lot of the research that they're doing and... Um, you know, the evangelical church or the church in and of itself is like on a sharp decline. And you're seeing people leave and leave and leave and leave. But a lot of these guys argue, and I think they're right, that we're not actually seeing Christians leave the church. What we're seeing happen is we're seeing people who liked Jesus, thought well of Jesus, but really weren't following Jesus, were walking away. And there, and that's who, and so we're not losing Christians, we're just losing nominal, nominal, is that the right word? Nominal followers? Something like that. But we are losing people who really didn't believe in Jesus in the first place. And, and that's important because we've got to understand the message that we're proclaiming isn't just a message of the goodness of Jesus. That's part of it. But we're proclaiming a message of a Jesus who 
allows us to go through trials and tribulations. A message of a Jesus who doesn't take us out of hard situations, but gives us what we need to get through hard situations. We're talking about a guy who is not going to give us everything that we want right now, but that is going to be fulfilled in heaven. And so we just, when we're proclaiming Jesus, we got to understand that not everybody is going to be called to be a disciple. And we just got to be mindful of that. But then that leads into the kind of the next thing that Jesus goes into as he's preaching, that true disciples find blessing in suffering. True disciples find blessing in suffering. Now, most of you have read this. This is the Beatitudes. And, you know, a lot of us have like, you know, People put these up on Facebook or people, you know, these are ones that we know all of the time. But as I did a little more study and research, they're pretty intriguing. And Jesus said in verse 20, he said, he lifted up his eyes on the disciples and said, blessed are you who are poor for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry for now you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you who or blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and re- revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. And you see, what Jesus is doing is he is telling us what it looks like to be a real disciple. He's showing us what it means to be a a follower of Jesus and the message that we're called to proclaim. And as people are intrigued by Jesus and as the power of Jesus draws people in, and even in our own self, as we think, yeah, I I am a disciple of Jesus. But there are times we've got to check our heart. Am I living like a disciple? Am I willing to withstand the suffering and find blessing? You know, it starts out that that Jesus lifted his eyes on his disciples. It's the idea that, um, you know, Jesus looked up and there's a whole great crowd, the, the multitude of people are all there, but then so are his disciples. And the first part of this message is directed right at them and he's, he's preaching it in a way that people can hear it and that the multitudes can hear it, but he's He's calling out to his disciples and he's letting them know what it means to be a follower of him because he understands when he leaves, there's going to be a lot of hardship and suffering coming. And he goes in and he kind of flips the cultural norms on his head. You know, and we think that um, it's blessed is to receive and blessed is to have power and authority. And Jesus takes us and just, flips it right over. And he says, blessed. Now that word blessed, it it means like a a, a privilege or a recipient of a gift from God. And when he's saying blessed, this is like one of the highest forms of honor and blessing. Blessed are you. And when somebody would receive this blessing, it would be considered like a great honor for to receive this type of gift. And how he uses it then uh, simultaneously with the, the things it does, it's it, it just mind-blowing. He says, blessed are you who are poor now. Oh, you just said blessed. Like this is typically what would be bestowed on somebody from a, you know, a king or a high authority, a, a great gift because of something that I've done or someplace that I've been. But blessed because I'm poor? Blessed because I'm I'm poor? Yeah. And that word, the, the idea of poor, um, and what Jesus is doing here is he's using, uh, you know, normal, everyday understanding of things. We understand what being poor is. Poor is very much a reality of a lot of people's lives. You know, we have, you know, some of us live in that state. Some of us have a lot of friends in there. We, we understand, we walk out into our city and we can see what it looks like to be poor. You know, for a long time, um, <clears throat> you know, we were, they were doing the warming center over here and, and, you know, we went and served dinner to them and it was heartbreaking. But you see, with Jesus, he's using that picture of, of this idea of being poor because poor, when you are poor, you desperately need things. 
You can't take care of yourself. And a lot of times people who are poor and don't have a lot of monetary gain do need Jesus in a greater way. Or they understand, because everybody needs Jesus, but they understand that they need Jesus in a greater way. And it, <clears throat> what Jesus is saying here is, you know, blessed are you who are poor. Now, people who understand their need of Jesus, who are poor, you know, Matthew says poor in spirit. Poor in spirit, understanding we don't have this all figured out. And a lot of times there is a, a physical realm to this. The, the needs that we have do draw us to Jesus. But he says, but for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are poor now who understand your need, who understand your desperation, who have given up of worldly goods for something greater, for yours is the kingdom. He's moving the the eyes of the disciples off of the things that they've had to sacrifice and on to the thing that is coming. He's moving their eyes from an earthly kingdom to a heavenly kingdom. And he's saying, listen, your blessing is going to come in heaven. And now the way he phrases it is they understand that part of that is now that they, they get to experience some of that kingdom, the Holy Spirit. We understand that the Holy Spirit is a, a down payment of what is yet to come and that God has given us what we need to get through this life, but we're not living for this life. This life doesn't have what there is to offer. We, we understand that we are poor and we need God's help. And then he ties in this idea of hunger. He says, you who are hungry now shall be satisfied. You who are hungry now, and again, you know, this is a, a felt need of, of not having the things that you need. Okay, right now I'm hungry because I didn't eat much of a breakfast. I can feel that. It doesn't take long. But he's talking about the people who are desperately hungry. You know, people who don't have regular meals. And he's, you know, kind of pulling that into the this, this spiritual life. He's saying, blessed are you who are hungry now. You know, and this is the idea of giving up earthly pleasures to live for the kingdom. Giving up, we want to stay hungry because God wants to satisfy us fully in heaven. But right now, some of those things won't be filled. You know, we look at our world and we look at, you know, what people are doing to try to fill their hungers, and some of these things we want and desire, but we said we can't have them. You know, we want to be filled by God himself. We want to continue to stoke our hunger for the Lord. You know, and again, there are a lot of times where this does come out in, in our material needs. You know, when we are willing to sacrifice the things that we have for other people and live in a way that humbly before the Lord, it does stir in us a greater need of God, but it's also a very spiritual thing as well. That we are called to live spiritually hungry. So yesterday, um, uh, my wife and kids were gone. They were, they, they drove, they went over to Michigan. My father-in-law was at a play. And so they were, um, uh, they left on Friday afternoon. And so, um, I realize I have a Saturday where I have nobody home. You know, normally we have five kids at home and your wife and five kids. You know, Saturday is like completely in utter chaos. And I woke up Saturday morning and realized it's quiet. I'm really lonely. I have nothing to do. And so I kind of started, you know, I read my Bible and did my normal kind of routine. And I was like, what am I going to do today? And then I got the buddy. Oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go snowboard. I, my family's gone. I have nothing better to do. I haven't been snowboarding all year. I am going to go snowboarding. And I did. And it was a lot of fun. But as I was riding up and down the chairlift, I was kind of going over my message and kind of thinking through some of these things. And, um, <clears throat> and I was kind of was kind of laughing and chuckling to myself because that used to be something that I would fill my hunger with. You know, anytime I had a, de- a desire or a long, you know, I grew up in the snowboard culture. You know, I thought I was going to move out west and, and get sponsored. And I was already, you know, uh, ready to get on staff at this ministry that ministered to snowboarders. And that was my entire life. And 
Every moment I had, I would give to snowboard. I would go uh, snowboard all day at the hill. And then, and, you know, at the night I'd go to Madison and we'd be filming and doing things in the streets. And, you know, that was my entire life. And I missed out a lot of God filling me because I filled it with something else. You know, something that I desired. It's not, it's not wrong. It's fun. I had a good time last yesterday, but I was chuckling to myself because, you know, there are so many things that we immediately put into our life to fill our spiritual hunger that's not God. Food, hobbies, jobs, relationships, friendships, status, Jesus says, no, blessed are you who are hungry, who are willing to delay that gratification, to push those things aside, to stay hungry for God. You will be fed. You will be, uh, you, he says, satisfied. Not on the things of this world, but on the things of God. And there are going to be times when you strongly desire to be filled. And God says, no, that's, that's not what I have for you right now. You know, and you start to see this idea of that being a disciple is not an easy thing. Poor in spirit, sometimes physically poor because we're Christians, because we want to give things up for other people. It means being hungry, you know, giving up things that satisfy us so that we can be hungry for the Lord. And he goes on and he says, um, you know, blessed are you uh, when you weep. For you shall laugh. And that idea of weeping that that Jesus is bringing out is this idea of weeping over other people where where you look up and you can see the brokenness of the world around you, where, where you understand that in this life we are called to serve and be broken over the brokenness. And there's a lot of times when, you know, I, I look up and I, it doesn't, I mean, it literally it doesn't take long for me to see the brokenness of the world. And man, I just don't want to deal with it. I don't want to feel sad. I don't want to mourn over the broken. I don't want to be moved by those things because that means I have to do something about it. And I don't like feeling sad. And so we forget about it or push it off to the side or don't get into the messiness of other people because we don't want to deal with it. But Jesus says, blessed are you who weep. Blessed are you who mourn, Matthew says. And that's, that's over the brokenness of other people, the brokenness of this world. When we see that, and it, it, it allows us then to, you know, when we do mourn and weep and are broken, it, it pushes us to do more for those around us. But we got to get to that point. And Jesus is saying, blessed are you. Blessed are you. And then his last blessed, he says, blessed, uh, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, when they revile you, when they spurn you as evil on account of me. But rejoice in that day and leap for joy for behold, your reward is great in heaven. Blessed are you. When people hate you, when people exclude you, you get kicked out of social relevancy. When they revile you, when you think you're the scum of the earth. When you suffer the the shame of an ugly name to a world and a culture on account of Jesus. Now this doesn't mean that you know, we, you know, uh, First Timothy reminds us that, that we're called to live at peace with people and do our best to have a good name uh, with the outside world. And so that doesn't mean that we're just go outside and we become a bunch of punks because we want to be hated. But it does mean that uh, if we follow Jesus, if we're disciples of Jesus, the world is going to hate us. And it doesn't take very long for you to have a biblical conversation with people where they're going to immediately start to... Uh, despise your beliefs. And those are hard conversations. They're not easy. We're actually, um, our life group right now is reading through uh, Rosea Butterfield's The Gospel Comes to the House Key book because it, it deals with this very thing. It, it's, a, it's helping us understand how to continue to have conversations in a world that hates us. And that's going to happen. 
if we continue to live as the way that God has called us to. But Jesus says, blessed are you. But not only does he say blessed, he says rejoice and leap for joy. Why? Because your reward in heaven is great. Because your reward is heaven is great. And he's doing this again. He's taking their eyes off of the worldly kingdom that's around them and he's putting it to the greatest blessing of all time, of all eternity, when all pain and all hurt and every tear and every broken thing is made well and every tear is wiped away forever. Well, we're going to live in harmony with God and creation and each other and that's never going to be broken. So he's saying, blessed are you. You see, when Jesus says this, when he's saying, blessed are you for being poor, blessed are you who are hungry, blessed are you who are weeping, blessed are you who are suffering ridicule because of my name. He's saying blessing not because we're hurting, but because God is the one who's going to fill that. Not because... We're weeping, but because the fix is coming. You see, real disciples go through this suffering. They can go into that because they understand that our blessings are not earthly blessings. They're eternal blessings. Blessings that came from Christ on the cross when he rose from the dead, defeating death, understanding that death is defeated and will never take these things again when we get to heaven. There's an assurance that, that every time that we suffer in one of these areas, it's a reminder that heaven's coming. It's a reminder of the work of Jesus. And it's a reminder that we can get through these trials and these tribulations because of Jesus. And if we're honest and we look around the world, you know, a lot of times we see these people who they, they put on a, a fake you know, they, oh, well, we're doing great, man. Let me just tell you about the vacation I just had or let me tell you about my new boat. Or, let me tell you about this. And we see people who put, to, you know, they have these put together lives. But if you start to prod and dig, they're suffering just like the rest of us. They're going through trials and tribulations just like the rest of us. But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have the one thing that's going to actually get you through those trials. And we are blessed because of it. And so real disciples of Jesus are blessed and we need to understand that because there are going to be a lot of times when you sacrifice a lot for the kingdom and, and you feel like, God, but you continue to pour this on me. God, I feel like I'm hungry. I feel so poor. God, I'm weeping and mourning because of my family or my neighbor. And God, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And we get angry or upset or bitter. But we got to remind ourselves, no, we are blessed. God is going to give us everything that we need to get through that trial, whether now or in eternity. That hunger that we have now, he already fills to some extent, but it's going to be filled perfectly in heaven. We need to guard our heart against resentment and keep our eyes on the mission. Um, I actually was, uh, I got home last night. I I wanted to watch, what's that new movie that just came out in uh, 19... 1917, I haven't seen it yet. I'm a big, I like, I like war movies. I'm a big war movie guy. And I thought it was out on uh, Redbox, but it wasn't. I was kind of sad and depressed. But, um, you know, I like watching war movies. And, um, you know, when you watch a, a war movie, something like a Saving Private Ryan, uh, there's a kind of two kinds of people. There are two kinds of sh- shoulders in a lot of these movies. There are the, oh, the, shol- the shoulder, not the shoulders, the soldiers who, uh, I know, I'm having problems this morning. I need to have like another cup of coffee or something. Um, but there's soldiers who, they have their mind set on the end goal. They understand what they're fighting for. They understand, you know, when you watch Saving Private Ryan, he has that picture of his wife and he's fighting for that time where he could go back and be a teacher at the school again and just have that life back. They understand we are going after this. This is our goal. 
And even in the moment of all the chaos going on around them, they can stay focused. And man, so, soldiers can do a ton under some really ridiculous circumstances because of that. But then there's some soldiers who lose that focus and all the trials and the tribulations and the things that are going on around them and the bullets and the bombs. And, and what do they do? They run. They run because they lose that kind of focus. You see, you and I, if we're going to be disciples of Jesus, that requires us to go through suffering. That requires us to sacrifice. And if we're going to be faithful disciples that are continuing to grow into the person of Jesus, it requires us to have that focus. Man, I am blessed. I'm blessed now because God has given me a family of believers around me. I'm blessed now because the Holy Spirit's indwelling me and empowering me. I'm blessed now because I understand that heaven's coming and I can get through this season because of that. And it's those things that allow us to march through. And you want to know something? When we are faithful Christians in those moments, when we feel extremely poor, when our hunger is really deep, when we're really broken for those around us, when we are ridiculed and persecuted for the name of Jesus, but we remain steadfast. We keep the blessedness of God in front of us. We long for heaven. When we live that way, man, people are going to notice. And people are going to see a difference in you because of the faith in Jesus you have that they don't have. And so we need, you know, we need to understand that true disciples find blessing even in suffering. And just take time to look around, Lord, help me find blessing in the suffering. And then lastly, we need to watch the cost of earthly gain. We need to watch the cost of earthly gain. Jesus ends this section in verse 24. He says, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so the fathers did to the false prophets. And see, Jesus then, he switches from talking to the disciples to talking to the whole crowd or the whole multitude of people now. And this isn't a, a woe as a, a condemnation, like this is going to happen, but this is a, a woe in the sense of a, a warning. A woe in the sense of a, of a warning. And that this is a, a very dramatic Whoa, this isn't like a whoa. But this is like you're, you're driving and someone slams on their brakes in front of you. You're about to slam into them and your kid's in the back seat. It's like, whoa! That, that kind of, well, that's, that's what it is. You got me, Ashley? Let's make sure you're awake. Okay. But, um, but it is, but this is the, the that word is a big deal. And it, there's a, a really heavy weight behind it. It's not fire and brimstone, but it's probably pretty close to fire and brimstone with a, a significant warning. He says, woe to you who are rich. And again, he's pulling in this context of, of being physically rich. And that's, he's dealing with a heart issue using a physical thing. And being rich is a, you know, I mean, Jesus doesn't lie about that. that is, it's, a lot of times it's harder to be a faithful Christian and be rich. It doesn't mean you're not a faithful Christian. There are a lot of, I have, I know a lot of people out there who, who do very well for themselves who are, you know, are, are very faithful followers of Jesus, but there is, you know, a drawing to money. But even, even being poor, we can still have this drawing to money, to being rich, to wanting to be filled in this time. And what, what Jesus is talking about is when we spend all of our time and energy to make the next dollar to make the next buck to the point where we don't need Jesus because we have it all figured out. We don't need Jesus because we can provide for ourselves. We don't need Jesus because we can get all the enjoyment that we want. He says, for you have received your consolation. Basically, yeah, you, you get nothing else. That's it. This is all that the life, you know, this is the only life that you have and you will get no blessings Beyond that, in fact, you're going to get the wrath of God is actually what these woes are pointing to. It says, woe to you who are full now, 
for you will be hungry. That idea of full now is continuing to fill your spiritual appetite where you put things in and put things in and put things in and every time you desire something, and Ashley uh, laughs at me all the time for this because one of my greatest like fallings of this is at night after you put the kids to bed and I'm just like, oh, I just want to relax. I just eat food. And I go and eat food. I go and eat a bowl of ice cream and then I go and make it, you know, get this or get that. And Ashley's like, Jesse, Stop, you're just filling. And it's true though. Like there, like this simple, even simple things like that, we turn to to fill this spiritual appetite when God calls us to a delayed gratification. And it's not just food. There's lots of things out there that we do. Um, but he's saying, woe to those who are full now, those who just every time you have a need, you just fill it. You are gonna be hungry. And the way he phrases that is both now and in eternity. Because the more that we fill ourselves with things that don't really fill us, we're going to be empty on the other side of that to a greater and greater degree. And ultimately, you're going to be hungry because you're going to be separated from the presence of God, the one thing that can satisfy your soul to its deepest longings, the presence of God himself. You are going to be separated from. You are going to be hungry. It says, woe to you who laugh now. For you shall mourn and weep. That idea of laughing, it's a, a light mirth because of your well-being. You're laughing around and looking how good you have it. And uh, there's actually almost an evil connotation to it where you are, are, are laughing at other people because they don't have what you have. Man, I worked for this. This is mine. They're, those people who don't have what I have, it's because they didn't, they didn't work as hard as I did. They didn't do as much as I did. You know, when we mock other people, you know, that's the kind of laughing that this is pointing to. He says, woe is you who laugh now, for you will mourn or weep. He says, woe to you when other people speak well of you. And that idea of speaking well is, again, it's, you know, we don't, God does want us to um, be respectful to outsiders, want outsiders to see that we are respectful in, in honoring people, um, but we also shouldn't give up uh, personal morals to make people think well of us. We shouldn't give up God's standards so that people think high of us. So, so the fathers did with the false prophets. The false prophets were the ones who would go to the kings and tell the kings what they wanted to hear and not what God was really saying. He says, woe to you who speak well to people so that you don't look bad, basically. But you know, as you look at these things, what Jesus is warning these people out, the, the crowds and the multitudes, but also us, is that you know, there is a cost to worldly gain. And we need to take time and even to examine our own life and understand that when we fill our life with worldly gain, we are losing out on the blessedness of God. And we need to take some time and, you know, use a level and just put our life up to this. Man, do I fall in that rich category? Am I not relying on the providence of God? Am I relying on the things that I can do and the needs that I can fill myself? Am I never hungry for God's word and time and prayer because I'm always filling my days and nights and mornings with all these other things? Am I looking down upon people Am I laughing at them because of my standard versus their standard? And a lot of times, we don't even realize we're doing this, but we do. We need to take stock of this and just put our life up. Is this who I am? Because if it is, woe is me. Woe is me. But also on the other side of this, too, this is the message that we proclaim. When we're telling people about Jesus, when we're telling people about their need for Jesus, we're not calling to them this pristine, easy life. We're calling them to a very difficult life. You know, a lot of people walk away from Jesus because we portray Jesus like this guy who's going to come in and never give you any trials anymore. Let me show you his power. Let me show you what he can do for you. And it's kind of like a, a two-trick pony and then it's done. But instead, we're calling people to a God who comes near to us in the suffering, who gives us a blessing to get through that suffering, who allows us to, to, to continue on day in and day out. But it costs our earthly gain. 
We give up what we gain here on earth. He takes everything and flips it on his head. The world thinks being poor is a bad thing. That's what God calls us to be. We think being hungry is a bad thing, but that's exactly what God is saying, the blessedness. We don't like weeping and mourning, but that's the very thing that God says to do. We don't like to be ridiculed. We don't speak up because we want to look good in front of people. But Jesus says that we should be blessed and rejoice over those things. Church, we need to find blessing in our suffering. We need to work hard at uh, giving up of our earthly gain. And, um, you know, if we are going to be able to withstand the trials and the temptations of this world, it's going to be because we have a strong understanding of the way that God brings blessing. And we understand that it's the exact opposite. I want to encourage you even this week just to take some time and understand, man, God there attracts a lot of people. Am I one of those people that's just been attracted? If not, if you're like, no, I want to be a disciple. I want to continue to grow in my faith. Then start to look, man, do I see myself as blessed when I suffer? Do I see myself as blessed when I long for things? Or am I just suffer, or am I, or am I just giving in for earthly gain? And I would just encourage you, just take some time this week and spend praying for opportunities for God to show you where you've allowed earthly gain to take your place. But then I'll also encourage you, even if you're thinking about the conversations that you have with people, when you tell about Jesus, you don't have to tell that your life is perfect. You can open up and let people see that you do suffer, but you're blessed in it because of the person of Jesus. And that's going to go much farther than anything else you proclaim.